Hi, uh, I'm Calvin Ma, uh, and so the research that I work on is trying to figure out what effectively changes implicit biases and consequently behavior. And so, uh, as Patrick and Ian have shown you, uh, we know a lot about what can work for changing implicit bias. There have been over 400 studies that have done so. Right. So, however, if a policymaker were to come up to any one of the four of us and ask us, you know, what is the single best intervention we can use to uh, reduce implicit bias, uh, we wouldn't be able to give them a straight answer. We know what can work in experimental isolation, but we don't know what uh, works best across multiple contexts, what works across time, and what works in a way that can uh, ultimately change behavior. And so, uh, as a first step, to kind of start uh, tackling these issues, we hold a research contest. Uh, and in this research contest, uh, I contacted researchers from all across social psychology, and I gave them uh, a simple task. Please submit an intervention that you think would be most effective for reducing implicit race bias as measured by the IET down to zero. Um, and so we, we got a whole bunch of submissions. Uh, so in total, uh, we got about 18 interventions. Uh, we told them they could submit any intervention they wanted. Uh, the two kind of major constraints is that had to be deliverable over the web, and uh, it could be done in five minutes or less. Uh, and we ended up with uh, four rounds of four studies, um, where we tested many of these interventions over and over, I think an average of 3.7 times each, and we ended up with about 17,000 people. Uh, so we have a lot of different types of submissions. You know, when you have 18, it's a, it's a whole, uh, it's, it's a lot of work <laughs> to put them all together. Um, and but there are a couple of general approaches that we noticed in the types of uh, interventions that were submitted. Uh, so for example, uh, one category of approaches was using counter stereotypes. Uh, so I think uh, Margot and Perry talked about these simple interventions at length, but generally they exposed you to some type of <laughs> counter stereotypical imagery. Uh, Perry positively liked a black person or universally disliked a white person. Uh, other interventions did not attempt to change the associations themselves. They instead kind of gave people strategies to overcome their biases. And uh, that way, you target control over people's associations rather than the associations directly. Um, and as a comparison condition, we even included a faking condition just to see how faking compared to regular interventions. Presumably, faking doesn't have uh, effects on actual discrimination, but uh, who knows. Uh, a third approach. Uh, uh, ask people to reflect on their deeply held values. Uh, values like egalitarianism, equality, and multiculturalism. And the idea here is that by reflecting on your values, you become more motivated to be unbiased, uh, and you activate some of these self-regulation processes, and perhaps the associations uh, will be reduced as a result. And finally, in the fourth approach, uh, some interventions uh, involve people, uh, involve perspective taking. So uh, taking the perspective a black person imagining walking a mile in their shoes, and presumably that would uh, increase several times older, self other overlap, uh, and lead to uh, more identification with black people in general. All right, so we have these four approaches. And I'm going to show you a big graph. Uh, and there's all these things on the side. You don't have to read them, please don't read them. Uh, on the x axis is a standardized mean difference, go and see. Larger effects means greater reduction compared to baseline control conditions. So we want things to be all the way up here. Uh, but what do we find? Well, let's see. Uh, we found that, well, some of them worked and some of them didn't. And so the first thing to think is, okay, so what actually works? Uh, one way to operationalize that is just look to see what is significantly different from zero. So these are, uh, the white circles are the aggregate effect sizes across the four rounds of the studies, four studies. And the, the white box is 95% coming from zero. And by uh, significant testing, we find that Half of them, 9 of the 18, were effective at reducing implicit bias immediately, and half of them were not. Okay, so we know that. Uh, but, well, what's different about the top nine compared to the bottom nine? One way to slice it is by looking at the category of the intervention. And when you do that, I do a little bit of color coding one afternoon. And you'll see that the red ones in the top, the blue ones in the top, and the green ones, the purple ones in the meat at the bottom. It seems that counter stereotypical imagery. Uh, and giving people strategies to overcome bias, uh, at least in this contest, tend to be more effective than uh, reflecting on your deeply held values or taking the perspective of another person in any number of ways. 
Okay, so within the nine effective interventions, you also notice there's a pretty big uh, spread in terms of how effective they were, right? The top one near cohen Z effect size of 0.5. Uh, the bottom one was uh, closer to 0.2 or 0.25, almost half the size. So what makes these ones different from each other? Well, one thing that we, we noticed was how uh, emotionally vivid and self-involving they were. So for example, the least effective uh, of the effective interventions was evaluative conditioning. And evaluative conditioning, you're, you're mainly just being flashed images of black and white people with uh, uh, good and bad things. Uh, but on the other side, the flip side, the, the ones that were most effective were incredibly vivid. Uh, so the most effective intervention, uh, you imagine that you're walking down the streets of some city late at night when suddenly, out of nowhere, a uh, evil middle-aged white man comes in and beats you to the ground. Literally, it's, just, it's brutal. It's very vivid. Uh, we, we had to include a trigger warning. Um, and uh, then he throws you in the trunk, drives away for an indeterminate amount of time, takes you out of the trunk, beats you down some more, uh, really crushes your pelvis, and all this really gruesome stuff. And uh, then out of nowhere, a dashing young black hero comes to fight out uh, the villain, and he saves the day. Uh, and so this is tapping into some of the things that we noticed were very effective. Highly emotionally vivid, highly self-involving, you imagine that your life is on the line, uh, and uh, it uses extreme kind of stereotypical imagery. So instead of what we often see in the media, uh, a, a white hero and a black villain, we're seeing the reverse, a black hero and a white villain. Okay, so very, very cool. From these 18 interventions here, uh, we have a good idea about what approaches are most effective and what are least effective at least within this context. One feature that I haven't highlighted that some of the other speakers have is uh, whether these effects persist over time, right? Uh, the ultimate goal of a lot of people who develop these interventions is not creating interventions that create change in the fleeting moment, but that create change that lasts. And so we uh, did a follow-up uh, to this, and uh, yeah. So what we did is uh, we did a second phase, and uh, the goal here is we just added a 24-hour delay to the design. Uh, participants would come back after 24 hours, uh, take uh, the measured implicit bias again, the IAT, and we wanted to see if these interventions had any effects that just lasted after 24 hours. We're not asking for that much. Um, and uh, so in terms of some of the procedural details, we only took the nine effective interventions, uh, and this time it was done with a participant pool sample rather than a web sample. Uh, so uh, here are the results that replicate the results from the original uh, phase of the research contest. And what you'll notice is that the general ranking of the intervention is about the same. The, the one noticeable difference here is faking. It turns out that uh, undergraduate participants, pool participants are much better or more motivated to fake than our web sample was. I'll let you read into that as you will. Um, and so we, have, we know that they replicate uh, what happens after 24 hours, right? One possibility is uh, they're going to have no effect. Uh, and the idea here is you know, they, they take a small intervention, they go back into everyday life, and the associations that they've built up over a lifetime are largely unaffected. But another possibility is that maybe a good intervention works like a good persuasive argument. You change the underlying attitude association, and it just kind of sticks around until something else comes, comes along the way to change it again. So what do we find? Well, what we found was surprising. We found that basically uh, nothing had an effect after 24 hours. Not, I said basically nothing because one did have a significant effect. It's a little hard to see, but uh, this one, implementation intentions, did have a small effect after a 24 hour delay. Uh, implementation intentions is a goal strategy. Uh, if I see a black face, then I will think good. And that had a coincidence effect size about 0.15 compared to the baseline control condition. Um, to give you some sense of scale, the largest, uh, hugest effect in the first phase had an effect size of about 0.49, uh, more than uh, triple the size. Okay, so what do these results mean for changing bias and discrimination? Well, a pessimistic view is that uh, uh, implicit bias is, is not uh, easily changeable, at least with the types of interventions that we did here. It might be easier to reduce discrimination uh, using strategies that pull onto other levels of discrimination. Changing how people 
uh, make decisions or, or change in the material circumstances that led to these biases in the first place. Um, but a slightly more optimistic possibility is our interventions were just not effective enough. They could be scaled up. So these were just five minutes of someone's time, and five minutes might not be enough to change a lifetime of experience. Yeah, five minutes. They got five minutes. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it could be that we just need to scale up these interventions, and, and some of the work presented here today have shown some of what scaled up interventions could look like. Um, I'd just like to highlight a couple other examples. So uh, Patrick and you know, Trish Devine and, and their entire lab have been working on a one hour long intervention that elaborates on many of the kind of approaches used here. And so far, at least when it comes to implicit bias, they've had some big success. Uh, in one study, they got a main effect, and another one, they did not. And in our own lab, we're developing repeated interventions with the idea that maybe sustained experiences over time could create change that persists. So taking a 10 or 15 minute intervention every couple of days over a couple of weeks might lead to uh, associative change that, that uh, has uh, longer lasting effects. So I'd like to conclude with some takeaway ideas. Uh, from this contest, we know a lot about what works effectively. Vivid, kind of stereotypic imagery. Uh, uh, emotionally vivid approaches and uh, goal strategies tend to be fairly effective. Uh, but it seems that these changes are not persistent on the scale of the interventions that we tested here. Um, and so this is a big challenge for the area of research, uh, this, this whole area of research. How do we create bias reduction interventions uh, that, that work, that really change the outcomes that we're interested in? Not just in post bias, but behavior in general. Uh, I don't have an answer for you, uh, but maybe in a couple of years, uh, we'll have made some more progress on the questions. Thank you. So uh, we'll, we'll stick around if any questions for me or any of the speakers, uh, raise your hand and, and we'll answer you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I've got a quick question. Um, in the 18 interventions, uh, what's the ones that didn't work with people labeled basketball? <laughs> <laughs> uh, basketball was uh, one where uh, they had people imagine or think about, you know, these. Uh, famous black athletes, uh, not Dennis Rodman. Uh, <laughs> other ones, I'm, I'm blanking on basketball players other than Dennis Rodman right now. But like Michael like Jordan, uh, LeBron James, and so on. And the thought was that reflecting these kind of very positive black examples would lead to some changes, at least in uh, the way that I sent it here did not. Oh, and every, yeah, and they represent the Yeah. Um, a, a Are you talking about the, the threat that might happen when you take the IT? No, I'm you know, you're talking about white and about blacks. What about yeah. the blacks being affected by other stereotypes and maybe incorporating some of those stereotypes in their own self and region in ways of power? Is anyone doing that? <laughs> gender-related research, right, looking at the reduction of implicit bias, there's some of that um, out there, but um, I think that's a great, it's a great point and something that, that needs to be looked at.
Other questions? Yeah. yeah I, said, I was thinking about the vivid emotional one. Do uh, you have a sense, empirically or just your own intuition, whether or not it's uh, people are thinking of blacks more positively or people are thinking of whites more negatively? Yeah. Right, I think that's a that's a big big question, especially when it comes to uh, relative assessment measures like the IAT. Um, actually, with the guy who just asked the question over there, Jimmy Cancini, uh, we've been doing some quad modeling that seems to suggest that the effects may be more driven by decreasing in group favoritism or liking for whites rather than uh, increasing for blacks. Although it's, it's kind of preliminary at this point, so don't quote me on it okay. too hard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Great. Well, have a great afternoon and a great lunch. And have a great